Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coding with Culp. Today is a great, great day to learn how to code. It's also a great day to hit the like button and subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it if you did. Uh, today's kind of a special day, a special episode, um, as it's the first game that we're going to write uh, on the channel, a game called Hunt the Wumpus, and a game that's kind of near and, and dear to my heart because it's one of the first computer games that I, I ever played. So we're going to start out by uh, talking a little bit about the history of Hunt the Wumpus, because it's a game you, you might not have ever heard of, but in reality it actually has kind of a famous place in uh, computing history. So in the game, you, the player, are cast into a cave, and uh, the cave has many rooms. And depending upon what version you're playing, the cave can have different shapes, um, basically a different arrangement of the rooms. In some versions, it's a grid. Uh, in the version that we're going to play, it's a dodecahedron, a 12-sided shape, and there's 20 rooms. We'll talk about that in a minute. Anyways, all you have is one arrow. Now, inside of this cave... In, populated in the cave in one of the 20 rooms is the Wumpus, and you're trying to kill him. Now then, as you move through the cave, you're also going to encounter other hazards, such as bats. And uh, if you run into the bats, they're going to pick you up and drop you in a random spot in the cave. Uh, there are bottomless pits, and uh, if you fall into one of those bottomless pits, well, the game's over. You're you, you die. And if you wind up with the, in the same room as the Wumpus, the Wumpus kills you and eats you. Therefore, you, you die and you lose. Now, you have one arrow, and if you think you figured out where the Wumpus is, uh, you can shoot that arrow. Now, if you miss, if you're wrong in your guess, well, guess what? You, you die. And the game's going to give you clues as to where the Wumpus is. And depending upon which version you're playing, the clues are a little bit different. In our version, if you are next to a room that has the Wumpus in it, you're going to see blood spots on the walls. If you are next to a room that has a bottomless pit, you're going to hear the wind rushing, but it's not going to tell you in which direction. And there'll be three different directions uh, that you can exit from. So um, as you walk through the cave, you got to take a look at these clues and um, try and figure out where the wumpus is and avoid the, um, the bottomless pits and the bats and stuff like that. Um, in addition, in some versions, and we're going to do that in our version, the Wumpus has a chance of moving. So every time you move, the Wumpus can move also. So the original game was actually written way back in 1973 by a guy by the name of Gregory Yob, and it was published in a magazine called uh, Creative Computing. And I've actually got a few of those magazines uh, from the 1970s. Now, um, although I'm old, I'm, I'm not that old. My, my first encounter with the game was not um, that version in 1973. It was a little bit later in 1980. Uh, let's talk about that over in the, uh, at the uh, workbench. And I'm going to show you some of those magazines and talk a little bit about the uh, history of uh, Hunt the Wumpus. Then we're going to come back and take a look at um, what might be the most famous version of Hunt the Wumpus. So, Hunt the Wumpus was first published in a, a magazine called Creative Computing back in the 1970s, I think 1973. And I have a few compilations of the best of Creative Computing. And so this is volume one. And let's see, I think this was published in 1970, 1976. And Hunt the Wumpus appears as a basic program listing. So way back then, let's see here. Computer, ah, oh, there it is, Hunt the Wumpus 247. So page 247. Oh, there we go. So right here it is, Hunt the Wumpus by Gregory uh, Yob. And way back in the 70s and 80s, magazines would have game listings or program listings that you would type in on your computer in a language called BASIC and occasionally uh, something called assembly language or uh, machine language. So this one first appeared in 1973, and this is a compilation of the best of creative computing um, as, a, as an article in a magazine. And you can see the entire write-up uh, right here. It includes a sample run. Now, with the original game, I believe the map would be different uh, each time, and so you would actually map it out as you went along. And then you can see the actual program listing right here. You can see it's a really, really small type. Um, in fact, these days, with as bad as my eyes are, I would have difficulty um, reading this and typing it in. Anyway, so this is uh, Best of Creative Computing, Volume 1. 
And then uh, Master Creative Computing Volume 2 had, I think, uh, Wumpus 2 and 3 published in it. So let's see here. Um, yeah, computer games. So Chase, Mastermind, Lim, Watchman. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, Wumpus 2 on page 244. So there we go. Wumpus 2 by Gregory Yob. And um, what it did was it introduced um, different maps, which we can easily do with our rendition of uh, the program, what we're going to do. So it introduced different maps. And I, I think maybe it even introduced some different um, um, hazards in the cave, but I'm not sure. And so here we go. It's the listing. A little bit longer than uh, Wumpus number one. Now, this was not how I first encountered Humble Wumpus. Um, I w uh, although I'm, I'm old, I'm not that old. Uh, so 1973 to 1976, I, I didn't even own a computer. Um, my very first encounter with Humble Wumpus was in this right here. Uh, more basic computer games. And these were essentially um, uh, compilations, once again, of a lot of the games that have... Um, appeared in Creative Computing, but it was edited by David All, and um, I think I encountered this right around 1980, 1981, let's see, or when's the copyright on this one? Uh, ah, 1979. So I encountered it somewhere around in 1979, maybe 1980, and really the same thing. It's just a compilation of the articles from Creative Computing and a lot of the games collected from different places. And right here is Wumpus 1 and Wumpus 2 on page 178 and page 181. Ah, there we go. So there we go. And uh, once again, there's that dodecahedron shape for the cave of Wumpus 1. And there's a listing for Wumpus 2, and once again, it's different cave styles. And I will show you how to modify our game to uh, include different different cave styles. I right, let's uh, head back over to the um, Raspberry Pi and let's take a look at some other versions of Hunt the Wumpus. All right, so uh, we took a look at, um, you know, magazines that um, Hunt the Wumpus was originally published in, or at least some of the compilation magazines it was originally published in. Um, and it remained primarily in text form for quite a while. And by the way, if you have a Raspberry Pi, you can actually play the original Hunt the Wumpus, the, the text-based version of it, um, and it's pretty simple. You have to install a package called BSD Games, which stands for Ber Berkeley Software Distribution. BSD was a version of uh, Unix that was very popular. And since Raspbian is a version of Linux, which itself is a flavor of Unix, you can install these BSD games on your Raspberry Pi. Actually, you can install them on pretty much any Linux distribution. Uh, if you have Ubuntu, the uh, command to install them is exactly the same. What you're going to do is you're going to open up a terminal, and you're going to type in sudo, S-U-D-O, apt get install BSD games. And notice there's a little dash right here, sudo apt get install BSD games. And I've already got it installed, so it's going to tell me that I've already got it installed. And in fact, you know what? It, it might actually come default installed on Raspbian. I'm not entirely certain. Um, but, but it tells me it's already installed. Uh, BSD Games is already the newest version, so I, I don't need to install it. But once you have it installed, all you have to do is type in WUMP, W-U-M-P. And there we are. Uh, sure, let's get some instructions. It basically tells us what I, I told you. If you fall in the pit, bottomless pit, you find yourself slung back out of the uh, far side of the earth, you're dead. Bats are going to pick you up, carry you elsewhere, elsewhere into the cave, and then if you happen to walk into the Wumpus, well, you're going to die. Uh, the Wumpus, by the way, is not bothered by the hazard since he has a sucker. Um, uh, since he has sucker feet, it's too big for the bat to lift, etc., etc. Anyways, uh, the way the game works... By the way, when you get to here, press Q. All right. We're in room number four. You're in a cave with 20 rooms and three tunnels leading from each room. There are three bats and three pits scattered throughout the cave. And your quiver holds five custom super anti-evil wumpus arrows. And I actually think five is too many. I think it makes the game a little easy, but, you know, it's just me. 
We're not going to play through this the entire time uh, due to uh, time constraints, but you are in room four of the cave. You have five arrows left. Sniff, I can smell the evil wumpus nearby. This is probably one of the worst beginnings you can get. Um, so there are tunnels going to rooms 11, 12, and 17. So we're in room number, what do we say? We're in room number four. And so we can either go to room number 11 and room number 12 or room number 17. So we type M11. That's going to move us to room number 11. Ah, you're in room 11 in the cave and have five arrows left. Russell, Russell, there must be bats nearby. So we can hear bats nearby. Let's go back to move uh, four. Let's go back to four. All right. So we are in room 13. Oh, what? Oh, dang it. <laughs> bats. Uh, picked me up and dropped me in room number 13. Um, so we're in room number 13. There are tunnels to room 6, 15, and 20. Let's go to, um, uh, we do hear um, bats nearby, so let's go to room number 6. Now, what I should be doing is um, mapping, but I, I just got dropped into a pit. The whistling sound and updraft as you walked into this room with a cave apparently wasn't enough to clue you into the presence of the bottomless pit. So um, in the original version, the bats could drop you on top of the wumpus or they could drop you into a bottomless pit and you died. In our version, we're actually going to test for those and so the bats won't be able to drop you into um, either the wumpus or the uh, or bottomless pits. It makes the game a little bit easier and you can easily make that change if you want to. But let's quit. Uh, oh, maybe it's Q-U-I-T. Care to play another game? No. Okay, so there we go. Now, um, the probably one of the more famous versions is a version on the Texas Instruments TI-99-4A, and it's a graphical version. And the Texas Instruments TI-99-4A was my very first um, microcomputer, home computer. I think I got it in the Christmas of either 1980 I'm going to say probably 1980, maybe 1981. I can't really really remember back that far. This is an um, online emulator called JS99er.net. And uh, let's see here. Looks like. There we go. All right. So I loaded up and I came down here to software. And you can go to more. And you can load up Hunt the Wumpus. Just uh, find it or type in Hunt the Wumpus and you can find it. Um, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, I hope it doesn't load that one up. Okay. Anyways, let's just play. <laughs> so this is Hunt the Wumpus on the TI-99 4A. We're going to go with an easy maze. Now, theirs isn't in a dodecahedron shape. It's not in that 12-sided shape, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, theirs is uh, more of a grid. But anyways... Um, Easy Maze has a, uh, basically the, the harder you get, the smaller the maze is, simply because um, in bigger mazes there's more room to maneuver around and more room to find the wumpus, etc. So we're going to go Easy Maze and then it's going to give you Normal Blindfolded Express. We're going to go with a normal, um, normal cave. And normally there's sound on here. I don't know if the sound's coming through um, on here. Um, but anyways, um, normally there is sound. And so we're just moving with the arrow keys, and this one actually shows the uh, tunnels. And, yep, yeah, okay, so what this one does, instead of bottomless pits, it has slime caves. And if you are within one of a slime cave, it's going to show you that green. So one of these here will kill us. And we've got a blood spot for the um, wumpus. So that means we could be within two of the wumpus on this one. Oh, bats. Uh, let's get out of there. Okay. All right. This is uh, getting getting tense here. Okay. The wumpus is oh, close by. Uh, let's give it a try. Okay. Oh, more bats. So I'm thinking. Okay. Oh, the bats have picked me up. On this version, you actually have to disturb the bats. You, ha you have to walk into them a couple of times uh, before you um, get the bats. I am going, well, on our version, uh, the first time you hit bats, they pick you up and drop you somewhere. Okay, so this is obviously a um, um, slime pit. We don't want to go in there. Let's go check the top here. Ah! 
Okay, I, I think I know where the Wumpus is, most likely. Um, I think, no, I was thinking he might be here, but I, I don't, nope, he can't be there. Okay, so, yeah. So I think the Wumpus, he's going to pick me up. Nope. All right, on this one, I think you press Q, and then the direction you want to fire in. So I'm going to fire down. Let's see if we got it. Let's see if I guessed right. Did I? Oh, I did. I killed the Wumpus. All right. So that's how that version works. Now, as I said, the, the game is actually, I'm going to turn this off because it's slowing things down. Um, the game is actually kind of famous. Uh, many people consider it to be the very first um, in, um, example of a survival horror, horror game. I, I don't know if I'd go that far, call it a survival horror game, but uh, some people call it the uh, very first example of a survival horror game. Um, Time Magazine, I think in 2013, um, named Hunt the Wumpus as one of its top 100 most influential computer games. Now, notice it didn't say best games, just top 100 influential um, computer games. Uh, if you play Magic the Gathering, the card game, there's actually a couple of cards that uh, feature the Wumpus, and including one called Hunted Wumpus. So anyways, let's, let's start on our version now. So... I'm going to do this video a little bit different. I'm, uh, biggest complaint people have is that my videos are long. Um, so they, <laughs> it seems like a, I, I can't make a video below an hour or below 40 minutes, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. So instead of typing it out line by line, at least for the first part, I'm actually going to just show you the code and go through it. This is also going to be a multi-part video. In this video right here, the only thing we're going to do is get our data structures up and we're going to be able to display the cave as we walk through it. So basically we're going to be able to walk through the cave. And that's pretty much it. So our cave is going to be in the shape of a dodecahedron, a 12-sided shape. And this is that shape laid out flat. So this is a dodecahedron. And this ring right up here, each vertice represents a room in our cave. So let's take a look at our map again. This is room 1, room 2, room 3, room 4, room 5. Each of these re represents a room. And this represents the tunnels going from that room. So room number one is connected to room two, room five, and room eight. When we look at our dodecahedron, if we called this room one, we'd be connected to room two right here. Room five, see room one, two, three, four, five. And this right here would be room number eight. Now, um, one convention we're going to have to agree upon is what direction is up, down, left, and right because that's how we're going to ma maneuver around in our particular maze. We're not going to call it out by number. So the user is going to be shown a room, and he'll kind of like the TI version, and he'll go left, right, up or down, uh, north or south. So what I did was, essentially, if you're going in this direction towards the top of the dodecahedron, we're going to call that up. If you're going to go in this direction, we're going to call that down. So from 3 to 12 is down, from 13 to 20 is down, from 4 to 14 is down, etc. Even though, um, you know, it looks like from 19 we're going right, it's from 19 to 11 is going up, and from 11 to 19 is going down, okay? And then from there we can define left and right. So if you're looking up, left is, well, <laughs> to your left. So if you're in uh, cave number 19, if you're in room number 19 and you're looking up towards um, cave number or room number 11, um, 20 will be to your left and 18 will be to your uh, right. Um, so let's take a look real quick of the final version of what we're going to be putting together. It may change between now and uh, the end, but um, I, I've written the entire, entire game. Okay, so here we go. It's going to give us our instructions. You can read them if you want. Press enter to begin. All right. Now, my version, I cheat a little bit. Uh, as debugging information, I tell where the Wumpus is at, where all the bats are, and where the pits are. Okay? Um, and in my version, you can actually have arrows lying around. Um, in this uh, particular one, there's no arrows anywhere. 
All right, so here we are. We feel a draft nearby. We're in position number three. We're in cave or room number three, and we feel a draft nearby. That means one of these caves, one of these rooms to the left, the right, or down, is um, a, a um, bottomless pit. Not a good way to start because we're just guessing. Although, like I said, we actually know where the pits are. They're at eight, four, and one. And also, let's take a look. We're in room number three. Okay. We are in room number three, so if we come over here to hunt the Wumpus map, we should have uh, down should go to 12, left should go to 4, and right should go to 2. And um, so we got down, so let, let's go down. Oh, let's look at our little cheat. And of course, in the final version, we're going to take this cheating out. Um, but uh, And the Wumpus is at 15, so let's go down. Uh, we hear the squeaking of bats nearby. So we know that uh, one of these caves uh, has bats in it. Now we know it's not the one up here, but it could be one of these. Now, one of the things we can do to make our game harder is have the bats move around the cave, and I might show you how to do that. All right, so we are in position 12, and we're trying to get to position 15. So let's look at this again. We're in position 12. To get to 15, we gotta go through 13 and 14, but let's do it this way. Let's go down to 20, see if we can go to 13. Is there anything bad in 13? Bats are at 13. Heck, let's just run into the bats. Um, whoops, went the wrong way. There we go. So we got bats, and they pick us up, and they're going to place us elsewhere in the cave. They uh, put us at position number 11, uh, which is uh, right there. Actually, let's go 19, 20, 16. Let's see if we can do that. All right, let's go to uh, 19. We hear the squeaking of bats nearby. Oh, I went the wrong way. <laughs> I'm not very good at my own game. All right, position number 12. Um, so we are at 12 again. All right, let's go 11, then 19. So let's go right and then down. Oh, <laughs> also the bats move. The bats move after they pick you up. Ooh, we're at 17. So let's see here. Um, we're at 17. I think the Wumpus was at 15. Uh, let's see here. Wumpus at 15. So we're at 17. Um, so if we go right. All right. So this red right here indicates a blood spot. So we know that the Wumpus is nearby. And what we're going to do to shoot, we're actually going to press shift. We're going to hold the shift key down. And we're going to press the direction that we want to shoot in. And your aim was true. You have killed the Wumpus. Of course, I did it by massively cheating. But whatever. It's my game. I can cheat if I want to. It's kind of like that song, it's my party, I'll cry if I want to. Okay, um, so let's get started in uh, coding this. So the first thing that we should do when we're, when we're approaching a program like this, because this is going to be a large program, four or maybe 500 lines of code, and it is the very first thing I'm, I want to do is I want to figure out what my data structures are going to be. In other words, how am I going to represent this map right here? How am I going to do this? Um, if it was a grid, you know, a regular grid, I, I could maybe implement it as a um, list of a list or a two-dimensional array in uh, another language. But but it's not. And in addition, um, each room, uh, you know, room one connects to eight, two, and five. Um, room six connects to five, seven, and fifteen, and in different directions. So. Um, after a lot of thought, um, and actually a few different versions of this game, I decided that what I would do is I would implement our structure as a, what's called a dictionary in um, Python. So let's come over here. What I want you to do is create a new folder for uh, your Wumpus program. So type in a little bit, okay, maybe the import statements, and then go File save as and I've got a coding directory and underneath that coding directory directory you can do a new folder and call it Wumpus I've already got it and then save it as Wumpus.py or learn Wumpus.py or whatever you want okay um, and we're also gonna have an images folder I'm gonna show you how to do that later when we uh, actually add images we're not gonna add images today okay so let's talk about our data structure because it is the single most important part of this program. And what I did was I created a um, variable called a called cave, 
and cave is a dictionary and if you don't know what a dictionary is i i um you, you need to go kind of look it up or, or just listen what a dictionary does and notice i uh, start a dictionary with the curly brace and inside of the dictionary has a each um data point basically a, di a dictionary associates a data with a unique key kind of like a real dictionary if i want to look up the word i don't know appetite when i look it up in the dictionary there is one and only one definition for it and so what i do is i put the key in this case it's going to be the number one and that's going to be cave number one and associated with cave number one is a list of four numbers and it's the exits from cave number one and they're in a very certain order and that order for me i just arbitrarily chose it the very first member of the list is um what basically um the up direction notice there's a zero and there is no cave zero what zero actually means is there's no exit there Okay, so zero is something special. It means there's no exit. I go up, down, left, right. So down, if you move down from cave number one, it's going to take you to cave number eight or room number eight. I keep using the words cave and room interchangeably, but in reality, this means room number one inside the cave. The down direction is going to go to cave number or room number eight up down left if you go left out of cave uh, room number one it goes to room number two and if you go right out of um, room number one it goes to room number five and let, let's take a look at our map room number one room number one up goes nowhere so it's a zero down is eight left right so zero eight two five whoops wrong wrong thing zero eight two five in room two and then i got a comma my next data point or data item is going to be the key two and j just so you know these keys don't have to go in order um you know it could be anything you want i'm just choosing to use numbers as my key because it's each number is the number of the cave so uh, key number two um we got up down left right zero ten three one so when i come over to here cave number two zero ten three one up down left right now let, let's take a look because i'm sure many of you may not know how a dictionary works i'm going to copy this i'm going to um, highlight it and press Control c and um, then what i'm going to do is i'm going to fire up python 3 in a terminal python 3 so what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste it. I'm going to uh, take my mouse. I've already copied it from here. I can't press Control V inside of here. I have to use my mouse. I'm going to right click and put paste and press enter. Okay. So there we go. Uh, now I have a dictionary inside of my REPL called cave. There it is. Now watch, watch this. Let's say I want to get the value associated with the key of 1. I just go cave and then bracket, brackets I put 1. And I get this out, a list. It is the list of uh, directions. 0, 8, 2, 5 from cave 1. Cave one. Um, up, down, left, right. Once again, I chose those uh, absolutely arbitrarily. Um, cave 10. So you can read this as cave, room number 10, has the exits. If I left up from cave or from room 10, I would go to room number 2. There is no exit going down. The exit left will take me to room number 11 and uh, the exit right will take me to room number nine okay um, and the last thing is I can actually get at these individually let's say I wanted to know all right um, room number 10 in the cave where does the where does the up exit go it goes to room number two because remember this is a list and I hope you know about list too and this is element zero element one element two and element three. So if I want element uh, one or element zero from the list, okay, I use a zero and that gives me the number two. If I want element three from the list, I'm going to press the up arrow here. If I want element three from that list, gives me nine. You must understand this concept to understand the rest of the game. If you don't, keep practicing keep doing some research ask me questions down below in the comments because this is the single most important part 
of um, this program. Our, our, our data structure that holds our cave data um, and how to move about it. Okay, now let's look at the rest of the program. And like I said, I'm not going to go uh, line by line. I'm basically and, and not going to type it out live. Um, I'm going to explain the program and then you can type it as you go along if you want. I'm also thinking about setting up a um, uh, GitHub where you can actually just download the completed program. But I honestly believe that there's some you know, educational value to actually typing stuff in. All right, so I've got a global and constants area at the very top of the program. And um, we're going to set our screen width and screen height. These are just variables. Screen width equals screen height equals 800. So our uh, window, our window, let me start this up. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Our window is 800 pixels across by 800 pixels down. Okay, now um, this right here is just some stuff that we can set. Uh, NumBat, so the number of bats in the cave um, and the number of pits that are going to be in the cave. So we're going to have three bats and three pits in our cave. And you can increase those numbers uh, to make the game harder. Uh, the number of arrows, there can be arrows in our version just lying around in the cave. And uh, you can make this higher um, to make the game easier. Um, because one of the things the game is going to check for is if you have no arrows left, <laughs> you're dead. Because there's no way you can kill the uh, Wampus. Okay. Now we've got some stuff that's going to keep track. Our player position is going to keep track of what cave you're in. We're going to start out... Um, it says cave one, but we're actually going to randomly set this here in just a bit. And the Wumpus position, uh, once again, we're just assigning it something. We're going to randomly assign it later on. Okay. But these are uh, variables that are going to track what cave you're in, what cave, or excuse me, room in the cave, room in the cave, uh, what room in the cave the Wumpus is in, how many arrows that you have left, and uh, the number uh, that you start with. So you can actually increase the number you start with. So if you wanted to start with five arrows, make it a game super incredibly easy, you could do that. Um, mobile Wumpus equals false. So in our version, the Wumpus has a chance to move around. And every time you move, you can set the chance that the Wumpus moves also. Now the Wumpus will never move on to the player, okay? Um, but um, um, if you want a uh, moving Wumpus, you're going to set that to true. And that makes the game a little bit harder. All right. Our constants for direction. So we don't have to constantly remember. Oh, God. Uh, let's see. Our, um, uh, was was uh, uh, element zero in our list? Was it up or down? I don't remember. Was it left or right? Or was left number three? You know, we're going to make some constants so we can just refer to up, down, left, right. You'll see what I mean later on. We're going to make some color definitions. Um, we're going to use all of three colors in this game, brown, black, and red. Um, and these are our color definitions. And then, of course, our cave. All right, uh, finally, uh, bats list, pits list, and arrows list. What we're going to do, because remember, we can have more than one bat, one more than one pit, and one, more than one arrow laying around, is we're just going to make a list, and it's going to hold the number of each cave that, or room in the cave. Gotta keep, keep uh, um, interchanging room and cave. But anyways, it's gonna keep track of the rooms inside the cave that have bats in them. So for example, um, there might be bats in room number one, nine, eight, four, and three. And so bats list will contain those numbers. And it just, uh, it's an easy, easy way for us to keep track of where the bats are, where the pits are, and uh, where the arrows are. Okay, so now I'm going to skip um, these functions here for just a second because I want to come over here to our main game loop and initialization area. The first thing we're going to do, this is actually where things start um, executing. Now, technically, they start executing here. In fact, I should probably move this, but that's okay. Um, in fact, you know what? I think I'm going to. I'm going to control X and I'm going to move these to just before the initialization area. Control V. All right, let me just make sure this still works. So far, so good. 
Yeah, we, we work. Okay. Still working. I just like to keep all my initialization and global variables together. And so above all of this is our functions. All right. So we've already gone over all this. I just moved it was all. And now we come to our initialization area. We're going to print the instructions. We're going to say, hey, press enter to begin. And in reality, they can press anything that they want. No, they do have to press enter. Um, we're going to initialize Pi game. And what this does, screen Pi game display mode sets our um, window. It's going to open up our window to screen width and screen height. No, notice that screen width and screen height are in parentheses together. And I set a few options which actually don't really mean anything. Uh, well, you can probably get away with uh, not using the pygame.hardware surface. It just um, creates what's called a double buffer in pygame. And uh, if it can, it's going to use the hardware to draw, um, if you have a graphics hardware, to uh, draw um, to the window. It may or may not speed things up for you. Pygame.display.setCaption does just what it says. It's going to set the caption of the window Hunt the Wumpus. All right. I've got three images, and you know what? Because you guys don't have them yet, I will show you how to dive. I'll see if maybe I can put a, a download link. If not, we will do this next um, next video. I'm going to get rid of these right here for now. I'm just going to um, comment them out because, like I said, you, you don't actually have those images yet. But we are going to set up our font. Okay. So this is the font we're going to draw with. And then we're going to reset our game. And I'll show you the reset game uh, function in just a second. But this is our main game loop. Oh, I got reset game twice. <laughs> let's get that out of here. Actually, let's get it out of here. It's not really part of our main game loop. All right. So we're basically going to do this forever. We're going to check Pi game events. I'll get to that in just a second. Basically, we're going to see if the user has pressed any keys. Then we're going to draw the room where the um, player is. Then we're going to flip the display. Remember, Pi Game draws everything to kind of a background layer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to flip that background layer so it's the layer that we see. So let's uh, let's take a look at each thing. Let's uh, take a look at check Pi Game events real quick. So I've got a function area up here. And so let's look at let's look at print print instructions first. Uh, that's the simplest of all of our uh, um, functions. It's on line 72 if you're keeping track of lines in Genie. And something you might not know, okay, this uh, triple quote, single quote, basically what happens is, um, because I didn't want to put a print statement for every single line, what this triple quote does is it will then print every single thing exactly as it appears after this triple quote, and then I end the triple quote, and then end the function, okay? So this, um, um, open uh, parentheses here starts to print function and then this open parentheses here ends to print function so just in case you are following along I will just uh, stick this up here and you can pause it if you want so that you can type in the um, instructions or the uh, print instructions function all right I'm gonna assume that uh, you've paused the video and done what you need to so let's collapse this and let's look at the reset game function. It's also pretty easy. All reset game does right now, starting in line number 98, is we're going to define num arrows as global. Um, remember, um, at least I hope you know, um, inside of a Python function, we can see the num arrows. Remember, num arrows keeps track of how many arrows the player has. Okay, um, we we can see that function. But we can't write to it unless we call it, we say it's global. We're saying, hey, uh, there's a function out there. It's called num arrows. It's a global function defined outside of this function. Or it's a global uh, variable to defined outside of this function. This right here, populate cave, I've got it um, um, commented out. Uh, we're going to do that next time. Populate cave is going to put, well, just what it says, put everything in the cave. And we're going to set num arrows back equal to 1. So we're going to start out with 1 arrow. You can change this, like I said, to make it easier. If you want them to start with 5 arrows, you can do that. Um, but we're going to start with 1 arrow. All right. Those are the two easy functions. Now let's do the two most difficult functions. Uh, check pygame events. All right. 
remember that uh, function called player position. Okay, player position, and in fact, I don't even think I need to declare it as a global because I don't think. Yeah, I do. I do write to it. Never mind. Okay, this is where things start getting hairy. They start getting a little bit complicated, and you have to understand the concept of that uh, dictionary. We've got a variable that keeps track of whatever room the player is in. Room number one, room number seven, room number eight, room number 20, whatever it might be. The very first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, get all the latest Pygame events that have happened. The key presses and mouse presses and mouse movements. We're going to put them in this thing called events. Just a, just a variable that's going to hold all the events that Pygame has collected. And we're going to say if the type is Pygame quit, okay, if the user has decided to quit by uh, possibly pressing the X up here, um, so if event.type equals, remember double equals test for equality, we're going to do pygame.quit and sys.exit. That's going to quit pygame and then exit back to the system. Else if, that's what elif means, this is where things start getting a little bit hairy. If event.type equals pygame.key down, in other words, if they have pressed a key, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into a really long if statement. It's going to check for each possibility that we, we care about. If it's the escape key, if event.key equals k.escape, once again, we're going to uh, pygame.quit and sys.exit. So we're going to exit again. So I'll show you that. Press escape, and we're out of there. That's another way to e exit out. Now we're going to check. Else, if event.key equals pygame.k left, if it's the left key, now here's where you got to understand. If cave, player position, and whatever's in left, okay, remember, let me show you in here. <laughs> Let, let's do this. Up equals, I think, zero down equals 1, left equals uh, 2, and right equals 3. I'm just showing you in the REPL what we're doing. Okay, So I've got a structure called cave. And let's say player position equals 7. All right. So the player is currently in cave number, or um, room number 7 of our cave 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 player position and then left is going to give us a number okay in this case it gives us number eight so let's look at um, room number seven remember this is up this is down this is left and that's exactly what it gave us, room number eight. So if they press the left key when they are in room number seven, okay, if they press the left key while they are in room number seven, and left corresponds to position three, no, uh, position two, um, we're going to set our new player position to room number eight. So let's look at that. So if cave player position left is greater than zero, because remember, if there's a zero there, we're not going to do anything because that means it doesn't go anywhere. We're going to set player position now equal to whatever that was, in this case, eight. We're going to set it equal to cave player position. Okay, in this case, it would have been seven from our example here. We're going to set it equal to whatever this returns, which in this case is 8. So now that moves us to cave number or room number 8. And we do the same thing for right, okay? We do the same number, uh, same thing for up, and we do the same thing for down. All right. The last thing we got to look at is drawing the room. So I'll pause here. Or you pause. I'll just um, not talk for a few seconds. You can pause and uh, type in, type out all of this. Remember, um, don't forget your um, tabs, your indentation. That's one level of indentation, two levels of indentation, etc.
Okay, let's look at the last function, and that is the uh, draw room function. All right, um, draws room in the back buffer. This is just another way to make a, a comment. Okay, just another way to make a comment. All right, so the first thing I do to make things a little bit easier, I say exits equal cave player position. Okay, so remember, the player position holds the uh, room number that the player is in. So that's going to return the list of possible exits from that cave or from that room. I'm going to fill with black, okay? Paint the background in black. Now, each one of our rooms is a circle. So, what we're going to do is we're going to say circle radius equals screen width divided by 2 times 0.75. Uh, so, it's going to give us a, a circle area. Um, in fact, let's just take a look. So there it is, okay, there's that circle. So it just simply draws that uh, circle. So uh, we're going to draw it to screen, because that's our, our drawing window. We're going to draw it in brown, remember we um, set that color way down here, uh, way down, way down here. I also set black, I should actually um, <laughs> um, use the word black right here. Let's see if that still works. It should. Yeah, it does. Okay. All right. So we dropped the screen. We're going to draw it in a brown color. Um, this is the um, um, where we're going to draw it at, our screen coordinates. We're going to draw it in exactly, we're going to start it in the exact center. Screen width divided by 2. Now remember the double slash is integer division. Um, we don't want floating point numbers here. It's going to complain if we put in a floating point number. So uh, basically if dividing this by 2 results in a floating point number, in other words if screen width or screen height were uh, odd numbers, it's going to throw out the um, decimal portion and just give us an integer. And uh, our, our radius, and that's the computed part right here. Also notice I converted this to an integer. Okay, that's what this does. Um, uh, because we're multiplying by 0.75 by three quarters, um, it's going to give us a, um, a fractional part. We don't want that, so uh, this converts it to an integer, and uh, we're not going to fill. Okay, now we're going to draw all the exits from the room. So there are four possible exits up, down, left, right. And what we're going to do is we're just going to check each one. I'm going to take you through. Let me uh, shrink this down a little bit. All right, I'm going to take you through just one of them. The rest of them are all exactly the same. We're going to check to see if there's an exit to the left. If exits, remember, exits is a list that contains the four possible exits from the room, up, down, left, and right. If exits left, remember left is equal to 2. So if the second element of this list is greater than 0, that means there's an exit there. Let's draw it. What we're going to do is we're going to set the top, okay, of this rectangle. We're going to draw a rectangle essentially. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look at that again. And we do have a uh, exit here from the left. Basically, what we're going to do, okay, is uh, we are going to set the top of this um, um, rectangle that we draw. Okay, uh, to screen height divided by 2, so it's going to start in the middle, minus 40. Okay, minus 40. Now remember, uh, in graphics, minus um, in the y direction goes up. So our um, rectangle is going to be 80 pixels um, tall. So we're going to start drawing it here, and we're going to go to here. And the left side is 0, so we're going to start, the, the left is 0, the x coordinate is 0. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a pie game, draw a rectangle to the screen in a brown color. All right, this right here is the top left corner, the x and the y of the top left corner. Uh, our x is going to be 0, okay, and our y is whatever we computed here, okay? So that's going to put us right here. 
and we're going to draw it as screen width divided by four, one fourth of our um, uh, screen width. So in this case, um, yeah, right about right about here. So our rectangle actually goes kind of about to here, but that's okay because it's brown. Um, so this is the width and the height, okay? The width and the height of it. So it's going to draw it out to here and then a height of 80 pixels. And uh, so we do the same thing on uh, each one of these. For the right, we're going to check for the right, for the top, and for the down. Um, this X and Y, I think I use it later on uh, in the uh, function. So what I'm going to do, um, I am going to pause for just a second. I'm gonna, yeah, there we go. I'm going to pause for a second. So if you want to type out this part right here, and then we're going to go down and look at the last part of the function. We're actually almost done. Maybe I can keep this video under an hour. <laughs> I kind of doubt it. But the other video should be much, much, much shorter because in reality, most of the work is being done in this video. So go ahead and pause it and um, type out whatever you want. Then I will um, scroll down. Okay, let's scroll down. So like I said, the rest of it was actually pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to draw some text. Okay, we're going to keep track of the position. Now, in reality, what I suggest you do is actually um, comment this stuff out because you might not want the user to know um, where they're at. But for our testing purposes, we are going to keep this in. So Y text position equals zero. This keeps track of the next Y position on screen to draw text. And that's going to be important when we start drawing other text. Right now, basically what it's saying is um, we start out drawing at Y position zero. Then if we have other stuff to draw later on, because we might need to, you know, tell the user if they hear bats or, you know, whatever it might be, <clears throat> we're going to want to go down a little bit, otherwise we're going to obliterate our text. So what this Y text position is, is it literally keeps track of where we're drawing our text at in the uh, Y uh, coordinate. Then we say POS text, which stands for position text, font.render, and in here we're going to put the, the string, okay, that we want, or the text that we want rendered, which is going to be POS colon plus our player position, whatever cave, I'm sorry, <laughs> whatever um, room they're in in our cave, because that's what this variable keeps track of. And we're going to convert it to a string, and that's what that does. All right, then the rest of it's the uh, color and a few other options. And then what screen.blit does is it actually then finally, what this, um, so let me explain this font.render. What it actually does is it makes a graphic object, okay, and then assigns it to this variable POS text. And so PS, POS text actually uh, holds a graphical object that we can then draw on screen anywhere we want. And we are going to um, um, screen.blit, position text, and this is the X and the Y. And in reality, we want this to be Y underscore text position. Okay. Because once again, we, we're keeping track of this text position, the Y position for, for a reason. And so that's pretty much it. Um, that's the, the whole whole entire program. Um, let's test it out. All right, so it um, gives us our instructions. We're going to press Enter, and here we go. So it doesn't do a whole lot right now. Um, we can see we're in room number one. And if we go down, we're in room number 8, we're in room number 9, room number 10, room number 11, 19, 20, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 16, 17, going left and right. Um, but it is what I promised you. We have our data structure going, it works, and we're able to move around our cave. So what we're going to do next time is um, we're going to populate our cave and uh, move around it and be able to check and see if we, we're running into anything. Uh, we may finish it next time. I, I, I don't know. So this may either be a two-part or a three-part series. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to end by showing you the entire program. Um, and I'll scroll it slowly. So if you'd like to pause, you can. So here's part one. Okay, let's scroll it down. Uh, we were in uh, line number 31. Oh. All right. 
So this is a uh, part part two. All right, let's see, line 60. So let's uh, scroll down to right around line 60. That'll work. There's line 60 right there. Um, let me... Okay, there we go. Like I said, you can pause and copy if you'd like. All right, let's scroll down. I think we're right around 87, line number 87. So go ahead and pause if you need to. All right, let's go down to line number around 110, 112. This is probably the hardest part to, par to uh, um, type right here. The stuff with the cave in it. All right, let's scroll down. If you want to, you can actually type this in, even though they're commented out, uh, because we are going to be loading them in next time. And I'll figure out some way to allow you to download those images. All right, let's uh, scroll down to what what's going to be the last of it. And so there it is, last of it. Like I said, um, this right here, the check room, um, you can go ahead and uh, put that in there. Um, just comment it out right now because next time we will um, be putting that in there. All right. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them down in the um, comment section below. I'll try to get to them. Um, next time, part two, probably somewhere around a week away. Um, we will, at a minimum, populate our cave and uh, be able to walk around in it and uh, avoid stuff. In reality, the game is actually almost done. Um, so it might just be two parts. We'll, we'll just have to see. Now, I'm going to warn you. Um, with the way I've done things, um, when we go to edit the uh, program, um, a lot of the uh, next parts will have to actually be done um, by by typing them by hand. So we'll, we'll just have to see. All right, if you've got any, any uh, questions, let me know. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, like, subscribe to the video. I'd really appreciate it. Today was a great day to learn how to code. Bye-bye.